welcome everyone uh, to this panel, panel discussion about living with arthritis and chronic pain. Uh, we are here for the Canadian pa Arthritis Pain Alliance um, to kind of get the conversation started for National Pain Awareness Week. I'm Lena Anderson. I'm an author and advocate for rheumatoid arthritis and disability. I live in Toronto and I'm hosting and participating. Uh, with me are Linda Wilhelm, who's the president of CAPA, also known as Canadian Arthritis pa Patient Alliance, but it's easier to say CAPA, and Michael Kluba, uh, fashion designer and founder of the Tumblr and Tipsy label. And we're here to talk about arthritis. If you are out there, please say hi in the comments. And if you have any questions or anything, hey, let us know. Um, and you can do that even if you're watching after we were live because you know we'll be back in the comments section. So first, welcome to Linda and Michael. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, so it's, it's be here. It's it's gonna be awesome. Um, so first, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we came to experience arthritis and and pain uh, before we get into the coping part. Um, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? Why don't we start with you, Linda? Sure. Um, I'm 61 years old. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis back in the Middle Ages, 1983. Uh, tr treatment was very different back then. And I was kind of prescribed aspirin until they, my ears started to ring. And then they said, you're taking too much, so you need to take less. There was really no, oh, you take this much every day or whatever. And you're really, it was just quite a different world and I didn't respond well to the other disease modifying drugs as they kind of cycled through them and ended up uh, in 1998 in a wheelchair um, and just really no other treatment options waiting for biologics to come in the market. Uh, I've had 14 total joint replacements or, for, or fusions from joints that have been destroyed by RA and then the result of that has left me with chronic pain and um, quite different from the initial pain and I know Michael can probably and you can relate to this you know where you get you wake up that day with RA and you just have this pain that you've never felt before in your life that's just you know the only thing I could think of is like your, your body's on fire that's exactly what it felt like to me was that somebody had just set fire to my joints that's how excruciating and then the chronic pain kind of is just that ongoing pain every day that just doesn't you know, you kind of leave it at a, you want to go by that ridiculous pain scale. I would, I always say, you know, I'm always at a six and then mm -hmm. if I get bad, I could go to a 20. So <laughs> <laughs> um, how about you, Michael? Um, well, I am Michael Kaluva. I'm a fashion designer. Um, I also have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I was diagnosed about 10 years ago with it. I don't know if I had it as a kid or not because we never did the testing for it. Um, but mm -hmm. I do remember the time that I had my first pain experience and it was going to school for a design and I was just walking back from a class and I got this excruciating pain and I literally just almost fell to the ground and I had to just call my doctor and see if I could get in. And after eliminating like kidney stones and other things that could be ailments, um, they did testing and I lit up like a Christmas tree. So ever <laughs> since then, um, I've been very conscious of the pain, I think more than I was maybe even before I was diagnosed. Um, mm -hmm. But I have more of like a stabbing pain when I get it of like knives going into my joints. So it is excruciating. Um, and there's no way out of it to be honest at some point so hopefully you can always try to relieve or not even get to that point is mm -hmm. what i try to do um i've actually lived with autoimmune arthritis since i was four years old um back in and i call it not the middle ages but the dark ages of rheumatology <laughs> when there was no treatment it took five years to get diagnosed uh, mostly because doctors kept dismissing my parents um, suggesting they go to, you know, a psychiatrist because clearly there was nothing wrong with me. So I finally got diagnosed and, and this was the age, as Linda mentioned, of aspirin, maybe gold injections. And no, my tush is not actually made of gold. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was steroids, it was aspirin, it was gold injections. And nothing really worked. So by the time I was 16, I had a dual hip replacement and a power wheelchair. 
And so I've lived with pain since I was about four years old. And I think the way I describe active inflammation is that it feels damp and soggy. And it feels like somebody's like, and, and somebody gave me this, this um, metaphor, like somebody's inserting a butter knife into your joints and trying to pry them apart. Uh, and I thought that was brilliant. And, that, and I guess that's kind of what happens if you have inflammation, it is taking up space there isn't in your joints. Um, my, my RA is currently controlled by a biologic, knock wood. I always do that because I'm superstitious. Um, but I also, yeah, I also have fibromyalgia. So that's weirdly, like the combo is, is the biggest issue for me. Um, and I think my average day, again, if we're going by the 10 point pain scale, which I don't like either, I'm usually, my average day is about a five, I think so. So that's us, and uh, we'd love to hear about how you experience RA and what your pain levels are. So pop them in the comments if you're comfortable to share. So let's talk about coping strategies for pain. What are some of your go-to pain management tools? Michael, do you want to get us started? Sure. My favorite thing to use is a heat pad for me on most of my joints. I have probably every size, um, every length and things for shoulders and wherever you can put one, I have it. And I will plug myself in and I will get myself heated up <laughs> um, on top of using my massager. Um, I use different types of massagers um, for different joints. I literally just got one of those power guns yesterday. So I haven't tried it out yet, but um, I have I think that one might be good for the elbows <laughs> um, and the knees. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I try to do that. Um, again, anything that I can do to make myself comfortable, I will do it. Um, I think also just having maybe your favorite TV show on to get your mind off of the pain or trying to get yourself doing something where it's maybe not so active, but you're at least getting your mind out of that pain threshold because mm -hmm. sometimes it's a dark hole <laughs> that you can get into. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even when you're trying just to do the best you can, it's just hard to get out of it. So um, anything that I could do, like if I have my favorite drink or a hot chocolate or just something mm -hmm. that gives me a little bit of that um, nostalgic, good feeling because uh, it's sometimes not pleasant. <laughs> it's like a bit of a hug, right? When you need a hug, there's nothing like a cup of hot chocolate. <laughs> yeah, so I just try to do something that's comforting and soothing and um, yeah, to really get to then if I have to take medication, I will. And Linda? Yeah, I mean, I, like you said, I try to stay a little bit ahead of it and try to not get to where I'm completely incapacitated before I treat it. So, so I do take the medication when I need to. Uh, I also will go for walks and, you know, they're not a big, you know, three mile power walk, a three kilometer power walk. They're 20, 25 minute, you know, easy walks with my dogs. I've got two little dogs that are always happy to go out. Uh, you know, I'll, same with Michael, I'll watch a TV show that I enjoy, music as well. If I, I find that if I put music on, it will lift me up, uh, read a good book. Um, some stretching and and I, I don't like the ice although I know sometimes on a specific swollen hot joint we have to do there but I remember when being in the hospital one time in 1999 before I got access to a biologic and I had so many inflamed joints that I had ice on every joint pretty much in my whole body and I was laying in this bed just encased in ice and the orderly would come by and he just you know he's almost in tears because he just felt so bad for me um, but now I use the hot water bottle i find right now you know it works really well if i get pain in my spine uh, or in the most specific spots just to feel comfy just to have that warm feeling mm -hmm. uh for me it's it's a lot of them are the same I, for me the, the my top really is treating my ra um having spent my whole life uh, without uh like without treatment most of my life anyway if finally the difference and the before and after between before treatment and the after treatment that work was like night and day. Um, I started using CBD oil once it became legal in Canada. I see a cannabis specialist and has made a huge impact on my sleep, which makes an impact on 
how well I am during the day. Uh, splints, heat, ice. Oh my God. <laughs> The issues of being alive. Phones are going off everywhere. Just ignore them. <laughs> Just ignore the background noise. Um, pacing myself, which is forever a work in progress, of course. Um, and I really like distraction and joy for me. My go-to is things like journaling or photography. Finding a creative outlet makes a big difference for me as well. Um, so yeah, so we have some overlaps. We have, I think. I think the big things is the usuals, the, you know, and then there's the distraction element. That's something that we all, that all matters. So <clears throat> let's talk exercise because it seems like every health professional out there recommends exercise, which can be hard to wrap your head around when you have pain. Uh, personally, I can't do like, de facto exercise because um, to my like moving my body in an exercise way ends up hurting but I like to say that my life is a range of motion exercise um, because I have limited mobility so, so simply making a cup of tea involves a number of stretches um, and I've also learned that building strength and stamina for someone who is as i like to call it as wrecked as i am uh is something that doesn't take weeks or months it's, it can take years so over time if i have that perspective i can gradually increase so that's my approach let's talk to michael first this time i know you you are more of a i hate to call it standard exerciser but you know like you, you actually exercise uh, I try. <laughs> um, it's not, it doesn't go every day. I wanted to go today for a walk and it just wasn't going to happen. But um, yeah, I try to swim if I can. Um, and then I also like using the treadmill if it's winter time. <laughs> and then if I can exercise outside just by taking a walk, um, I try to get in. Uh, my goal is 10,000 steps a day. Does it happen? No, not every day. It happens yeah. sometimes, <laughs> yeah. but at least I try. Um, I try to, I think I probably average seven to maybe five to 7,000 yeah. a day. So, um, but good. I try to offset other things. Like if I can take the stairs and I'm feeling okay, I try to take the stairs. Mm. Or um, if I try, if I have the swimming pool available, I try to use a swimming pool. So um, I just try to alter it a little bit and I don't get down on myself for what I don't do. I get you know, really mm -hmm. proud of myself for what I do to accomplish that I day. Think that's really and every good. day is a new day. Yeah. And I think that's a really good, important point. And I really love your point about it. it's like, it's not always about going to the gym. It can be something as simple as going for a small walk, et cetera, which I suspect, Linda, you'll talk about your, your dogs and the walks. Yeah. And then that's exactly it. And in the winter time, I actually include what it takes to get ready to go for a walk as part yes. of my exercise. So if I'll say I did a half hour of exercises, 10 minutes of that, probably just trying to get a coat and boots and hat. <laughs> and I figure that counts because I'm exercising enough trying to do that. Um, and just to get outside. I think, you know, even the other day when it was a nice day, I try to get outside with my cup of tea and sit on the deck and just, you know, listen to the birds, listen to watch the sun sit in the nice warm sun. And uh, yeah, and like I said, I'm, you know, when I go for a walk, it's, uh, you know, you have to pick your walking area carefully because I can't walk through the woods and stuff. My grandkids live close and they're always saying to me, oh, come, come go for a hike through the woods because they're in the woods and no nanny can't walk through the woods. Uh, I'll take the road and you guys can meet me on the other side. Or, and so, yeah, I think it's knowing your limits, but just that getting out every day, just and I was because I mean, being in pain is really hard on you and then you can get depressed and you can get down. And I like what Michael said, you know, don't beat your yourself up for what you didn't get done you know think about what you did accomplish that day and oh you know, yes I you know I did get for a 20 minute walk and and that's a big deal for you know I remember one time when I was just after I started a biologic when I was had been in a wheelchair just walking you know 10 feet to the mailbox was something to celebrate and yeah. you know so I figure that you know you do your best you can and I know there's I, like I need to do some strengthening exercises because I can feel my back kind of going a little bit weird lately so but I'm then now with winter coming i'm gonna to have to focus on trying to get back my physio back exercises 
Well, and I think one of the important things here is also what, what Linda mentioned that um, sometimes putting on a coat counts. I think it all depends on how you feel. And, and for me on a bad day, getting back to making a cup of tea or playing with the cat, that counts as exercise. I also call my morning ritual of, you know, shower, getting dressed, my morning exercise, because after I'm tired. So, um, so remember that on bad days, taking care of yourself counts, making a sandwich counts, which brings us to limits and knowing your limits and which can be, it, it, which can be tricky once, you know, given that they change every day. Uh, Linda, how do you, how do you manage your, li your limits? What happens when you push past them? How long does it take to learn your limits? Because God knows I haven't yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I've learned my, my limits yet all the time. Um, you know, I get, you know, frustrated. You know, it's frustrating trying to live with this disease and with the damage from the joints and trying to get through every day. And and for limits, you know, I, you know I'm still learning my limits. I, I'm better now than I was 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, I would run myself till I would literally collapse and not be able to take another step. So I don't often get to that point anymore. Um, and I learned that I have to cut or else I'll be no good for nothing. And, and it's interesting that, um, you know, you'll go, go, go. And then you'll stop and you'll think you're fine and you stop and you sit down and then like five minutes later, you try to get back up again. And it's like, Oh no. <laughs> and that was yesterday when vacuuming, I vacuumed the house, which also counts as exercise. Um, but uh, you know, and that was it. I afterwards I thought I'm doing great, but then I sit down and I go to get back up again. And it's like, Oh, you know, so I think we all need to work on our limits and we, we have to I don't beat ourselves up when we get past them and know mm -hmm. that you, know, you can go have a nap or you can take a rest and go to bed at eight o'clock at night if that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. Michael? Um, yeah, I'm the same thing. Um, I went to bed a few times this week at eight o'clock or before. Um, you just have to listen to your body and uh, mm -hmm. really you're the only person that can really define of what is going to be your limit. And mm -hmm. um, I know mine is when I get overly tired or something like that. My body really physically, I can feel it just shut down. So mm -hmm. I try to keep well rested. Um, even if I get up early, I try to go to bed early as well. Um, I do a lot of things better in the morning than I do at night. And I know that. So I just try to work around it myself. Um, and yeah, I just, um, I try to drink a lot of water and just know that if I keep myself hydrated and keep myself sleeping, that my limit should be. I'm pretty good from six to six is how I look at it. And then <laughs> after that, I have to shut off yeah. um, and for a lot of reasons. And I think that's yeah. always good because I go to bed early. So for me, um, yeah, I also think with exercise too, mm -hmm. if I start to feel any pain or any discomfort, I always stop um, and just let it go to the next day and resume mm -hmm. if I feel like it. If not, take another day, take a, take two days, mm -hmm. take a week. Um, mm -hmm. and you'll get back to it, but just don't over push it because that's when you really get into trouble, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm just going to say hi to Christina and Kathleen who said hi in the comments. Hey, Hello. Hi. So, it's so nice to see you out there. Um, just a reminder that if you're watching this, just uh, and you have any questions or comments, or I want to share your story, just pop them into the the comment section as natalie just did nice to see you uh we will um uh we'll pot we'll look at questions probably towards the end um maybe they, we'll we'll wing it essentially so i think the limits one of the things i've actually been doing for the pandemic because it has been examining my limits i'm a big fan of doing less well, theoretically, <laughs> doing less than I know I can, because I know then I won't crash tomorrow and then lose a week or two or three to healing. So doing a little less every day, saying no, and that whole, whole infamous listening to your body, how exactly you do that, <laughs> that is a kind of a, a, another work in progress i found that if i crash to linda's point is like don't don't beat yourself up but try to pay attention and i try to listen 
to the lessons in the sense that what were some of the signals I, I ignored. Um, so I'm beginning to <clears throat> get better. And all these years into the process, just this week, I learned that when, when I kind of, when I think just two more days and then I'll relax, um, that's the first sign <laughs> that I'm about to push through some limits that I shouldn't. So that's really valuable. Like if you know some of your your signals that, that things are going bad, let us know in the comments. I think also getting comfortable with once you get those signals to say, okay, I'm going to drop everything right now because that may save you from a flare. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that can trigger flares and pain or maybe help avoid it. And for some people that's diet, personally diet has never worked for me um, other than food is good and therefore I have some pandemic extra pounds. Um, but uh, yeah, no, so, so diet has never really been a huge trigger for me. Um, what about what about you guys? Um, let's start with Linda. Yeah, I mean, I, if I don't eat well, then I, my pain gets worse. So and lots of times I will, you know, I'll just get busy during the day. And then all of a sudden, it'll be like two o'clock in the afternoon. And I think I haven't eaten anything today. No wonder I feel like I'm about to collapse. So I think you have to eat well to, to feed your body and our, our bodies are in constant inflammation, constantly being attacked. So we have to fuel them so they can something there to fight back with. And, you know, right now my rheumatologist is on mat leave so i'm trying to be really careful because i can't afford to have a flare-up so i'm i am being careful and i remember back when i ran out of treatment options back in 1998 i uh i was just looking for anything that could help and i ended up uh with this nutritionist that was trying to sell me a bunch of supplements and told me I couldn't eat white flour, white potatoes, white sugar, which probably are all not that great for you. But at that point, I could barely do anything for myself. So here I am trying to cook all these meals from these lovely, you know, basic foods that from scratch that I didn't have the energy to do so I ended up not eating hardly anything because I was afraid to eat anything and then I ended up in even bigger trouble so so I you know I, I think all of us with RA we've had people say oh you know just take cider vinegar or, or just take honey or mm -hmm. or there's some nice magnets that'll work for you and and you know I just I think we've probably heard it all in our lifetime about all these things that will cure our RA and and for me I think it just makes people feel like they've done something to cause this to themselves and that's just not true i mean yes we can all benefit from eating healthy and exercising and taking care of ourselves but we did not cause this disease by anything that we did and mm -hmm. and i think by by people you know and that's how i take it when people have all this advice that they think that they're helping that it's not well and i think to your point there's also fashions in food but <laughs> whereas like in the late 90s, white potatoes were bad. And now I think nutritionists are saying, no, potatoes have all sorts of healthy vitamins and can be an important source of food if, if you, you know, if you want. Um, so I think part of it is about finding out what works for you and what doesn't and keeping a symptom diary or using a tracker app may help you identify if you have any dietary triggers. But I think the important thing is, like Linda said, make sure it's something you can actually do. Is it sustainable? Is it actually sustainable in the sense that you can do it? Um, and, and is it something that's going to wreck you? Then, because if it is, there's no point. What about you, Di uh, Michael? Do you use diet to manage your symptoms? Oh, yeah, I've used diets forever. <laughs> um, I have to stay away from a lot of sugar. Um, mm -hmm. I have a really weakness for sugar and chocolate. And I have to stay away from that. I try to keep down my dairy a little bit and mm -hmm. um, also not too high of fat or too much red meat. So mm -hmm. I try to go for the turkey and chicken and the fishes mm -hmm. and and then also the starches. I try to limit as well. Um, you know, if it's just a handful or, you know, that's about the size that I need for my stomach of portions. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of been going off that um, more and more as I've noticed that my metabolism has slowed down a lot since I don't work out as much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with diet, I can still keep 
you know, exactly where I want to be at comfortably. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you always can have your cheat days and those fun mm -hmm. times that your body does need and your mind does need. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can be strict, but I think there's always, um, there's always, a, there's always a, a nice time for a celebration of sort. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think like, uh, and this is a follow-up to Linda's comment, Natalie out there says that food is tricky. I reach a state of being completely scared of food. And I think that's that I think that speaks to that point of that for a while there's been a really big focus on how food is the answer. And like food is important, but it doesn't actually work for everyone. And I don't think there's enough research in it. I saw a survey, and surveys are not terribly uh reliably reliable in the scientific way but a, a survey said that um i think three quarters of the people involved in the survey, survey didn't react to food so i think that that push for well just eat the right thing i think it kind of blames you for something that's as linda said is not your fault so i think finding a healthy balance and a healthy perspective on food is far more important like it's fuel, right? And and your body and and whether it helps your RA or not is or whatever form of arthritis you have is less important than support your body so it can support you as you have RA. So the healthier you and more balanced the diet you can eat and that you can afford, that will support your body. And I think that's that's the key. Um, so Kathleen asks, hello, mm. Kathleen, uh, did finding the right medication help you tolerate more food? And again, for me, I would say that once I started biologics and they actually worked, I had the weirdest experience that my body had an almost aggressive quest for health that I got to the point where like eating, eating a cookie or chocolate bar made me feel, it made, it made me feel sick. Um, because all I wanted was foods that built it back up. And that was sort of my experience. <laughs> um, but I didn't really have food triggers before. So what about the two of you? Did, did finding that medication help you? Um, I just know for me personally, I was on methotrexate last year and uh, I couldn't eat at one point because of it. I, everything tasted like metal to me mm. and um, I had sores in my mouth at one point, so I was on a liquid diet. So yeah, medication does play an important role for your food. Um, once I got off of it, my taste buds have changed. I can now eat spicy food. I've never done that before in my entire life. I can now keep up with my partner who loves really spicy food and it doesn't even tolerate me anymore I, for some reason. So um, yeah, your medication does affect, I think, your mm -hmm. um, the, what foods you can tolerate at what times, mm -hmm. periods too. What about you, Linda? Yeah, I had the same experience with methotrexate as Michael. I just had no appetite. And I think at one time when I, when I went into the hospital before I got on the biologic, I was about 90 pounds. So, um, you know, I'm not a big person. I'm 115 normally, but uh, that was a, a huge weight loss. And that was from methotrexate. It was just hard to eat anything. Plus, when you're in so much pain, you don't want to eat. I mean, you really, you don't, your appetite is gone. You just feel like you're kind of wasting. It just, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not something that appeals to you. Yeah, I had to force myself at times to eat. And, and then it's even more important that what you're eating is healthy mm -hmm. because you're not getting a, a lot of food. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, uh, in medication, when I was on the biologics, say, you know, I, it did help where I was able to start eating most things again. But now I find, again, age is coming into the factor as well. Like, mm -hmm. well, I can't eat fried food. You know, mm -hmm. french fries and you know the, all the fried food anymore you know it just doesn't sit right and and mm -hmm. the, the chocolate if i eat you know too much chocolate or too much sugar too much sweet it um you know you know even a donut now if i eat a donut will almost make me feel like i don't feel well so mm -hmm. i think you know it's a combination of living with ra for so long plus age is also coming mm -hmm. into it well, and I think um, to answer Kathleen's uh, question from my point of view, I think before RA inflammation has always made me really nauseous. Um, and I was 
before I found a biologic, I was very thin. I was, I'm about 5'2 on a good day. And I was less than 100 pounds because I just couldn't eat. I was nauseous all the time. And then I found a biologic and I was ravenous. Like the big, one of the biggest gifts is given me other than controlling my, my RA is that I can eat food without becoming nauseous and I am not struggling with nausea all the time. It also made me gain weight and then, you know, middle age and all of that, but it did make me gain weight. And the weird thing was because I had lost so much weight due to the inflammation that when I gained the weight, it was actually kind of nice to feel solid and not fragile again, right? And being able to eat. So, so I think it's, it's not controlling your RA will improve the rest of your life in unexpected ways, I think. Which brings me to the topic of sleep, because uh, pain can really mess with your sleep. There's a name for it. Well, there's a name in our community for it called pain insomnia, which is basically insomnia due to pain. Uh, but sleep is so important. It's when you recharge and when you heal. And finding a way to sleep is really important. Um, Michael, how how is your sleep and how do you deal with any sleep issues? Um, I have medication for my sleep just to make sure mm -hmm. that I can get the full amount that I need every night. Um, I do suffer with it. Um, my mind races a lot always because I it's hard to turn off sometimes after a full day. Um, so for me, I just really need that time of relaxation. I need to check out for a few hours before I go to bed. I don't do anything important. Um, and I really do have those few hours before my sleep that I just either just watch TV or read a book or do something where it's just kind of vegging out and checking out. Linda? Yeah, and the same with me. I, I, my mind gets racing, and especially during COVID, where it was just seemed like it was so stressful for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really exasperated. And and I was at one point waking up every hour all night long, and this went on for a couple of months. And my husband just finally said, "Why don't you try some medical cannabis? See if it will help mm -hmm. you." So I ended up getting some gummies, and I experimented because you know it's hard to know what to take. There's no you know there's no prescription for it per se. And uh, and I started out with five milligrams. It ended up to be about ten to twelve milligrams. Of seems to be the ideal dose for me um i've been doing that for about three months now and it's just unbelievable the difference i mean i just for some reason it turns my mind off for one thing uh and the, the one i take is just it relaxes my body so that i can actually lay there or i used to do the meditation relaxation exercises it never seemed like always seemed to get sidetracked and it wouldn't work but with the medical cannabis it allows me to do that so i take it and then i can just focus on my body and say okay now you got to relax and you just feel yourself sinking and next thing i know it's like four hours later and i still wake up to go to the bathroom at night and stuff for mm -hmm. you know to get four or five hours sleep and then go back to bed and then sleep for another four hours is it's just been absolutely life-changing um, and I think for me, it's it's two tools. Uh, the first one was getting a good bed. Um, and I ended up buying a really expensive bed um, because this was during a time when um, my fibromyalgia was much more active and my sleep was not, it was difficult. Um, and I started thinking, I thought, well, if you spend a third of your life in bed, number one, <laughs> It's worth the investment. Number two, when you have pain, uh, buying the best bed you can afford is can really make a huge difference. I actually ended up saving up for it for a long time and, and looking for the right bed and finally found one. And it makes such a difference. And number two uh, was CBD oil. Um, you can, now that it's uh, legislated, there are cannabis clinics uh, where you can talk to a cannabis um, specialist and in Ontario, at least, probably in other provinces too, but because it's legal now and it is a medicinal use, um, talking to a cannabis specialist is covered by my provincial um, insurance plan, so that's OHIP, um, which was a big help for me because at the point I'm like, I don't know what works, right? So, but um, they got me started on something. I take CBD oil before I go to bed every night and it's the best sleep i've had in decades uh it really is i highly 
Well, I shouldn't be recommending, but <laughs> even that is legal. Guess what? You can absolutely look for it. And I don't know, I don't know what it's like in your province out there, but I live in downtown Toronto and we have more cannabis stores than um, coffee shops at the moment. So, um, and, and often people working in a cannabis store will be quite knowledgeable. But again, like check out um, cannabis, like official province paid cannabis clinics if you are worried. Uh, we also have, oh, Linda's disappeared. Um, oh. She'll hopefully be back. Uh, we also have uh, someone in our community, Christina Montoya, the arthritis dietitian. Um, has some certifications in cannabis, so we follow her. Um, shameless plug. Um, but it's definitely, if it's something you've been thinking about, um, there is there is actual guidance out there, and I think Linda is coming back. So um, we are kind of moving to, and I do hope Linda is coming back. Yeah, there she is. Uh, I don't know what happened. It just clicked up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So now we're talking about, we're going to take the step wider, which is advocacy, because many of us who live with arthritis and um, chronic pain eventually turn to advocacy. And I know all three of us are doing advocacy. So um, it's kind of a way to to feel more purposeful and feel like your pain has a purpose. <clears throat> let's talk about how we use and what kind of advocates we see we do. And let's start with you, Linda. Um, how do you advocate? Sure. Well, I started advocating back in probably 2000 because I got, um, I went, tried to get access to the biologic. It had been approved in the U S <clears throat> but wasn't <clears throat> approved in Canada. It took 763 days longer to get approved in Canada. So for those, you can do the math. That's over two years. Um, and I needed this drug. As I said, I was at the end of the rope. I was in a wheelchair. I spent three months in a hospital. I tried to talk to my M MLA when they came around at election time and she was uh, <clears throat> told me that I, it was very complicated and it was probably too difficult for me to understand how this all worked. So then that just made me mad and <laughs> I decided I was going to learn how it all worked. So that I started out and we knew, um, I got connected with the Arthritis Society at the time who had a very, uh, our CEO who was just knew that we were going to have trouble getting these drugs covered. So he started, was responsible actually for the creation of Kappa in 2002 and then eventually they got another CEO and we ended up separating and going on our own but we ended up meeting with government uh, in 2001 in Ottawa a whole bunch of us patients went and we really just showed them what this disease had done to our hands and to our bodies and then we started meeting with the provinces province by province and by 2003 they had covered all the biologics and up until that time we had never seen drugs that were twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year. So this was a major, major thing. I got involved then later on in the chronic pain community. And I'm on the Chronic Pain National Task Force that just released its final report, which is an actional action plan for pain in Canada. And uh, we've been doing some work with government. And I, just the last five years, we've seen things really grow on the chronic pain front, even despite the last two years with the pandemic. We're still seeing progress where provinces are starting to recognize that this is a very serious issue. And I, quite frankly, I think it was the opioid crisis that was the impetus for the work but uh, initially chronic pain was excluded from the opioid uh, debate and the opioid dialogue and Kappa at that time had written a number of letters to Health Canada before we finally got invited to the 2018 symposium uh, where they did have chronic pain as a side kind of side theme and then uh, the minister announced a task force at the next uh, chronic pain society uh, meeting, uh, scientific meeting. So we're very involved in advocacy. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's think, thankfully you are because the fact that when you're talking about opioids and guidelines and potentially restriction, not inviting people living with chronic pain to the table seems odd. Let's just say, um, Michael, how do you, how do you do advocacy? Um, I do it through fashion mostly. Um, I have always my runway shows 
Um, I partner with Creaky Joints and GHLF in the US and also in Canada. And I love working with them every year. They um, give me the opportunity to have my advocacy come out in artwork and in different forms, even with the models being uh, patient advocates or even uh, arthritis patients themselves. Um, I like to be all inclusive with my shows. So anybody with diversity as well, I'm really you know, in tune with, um, we've done that since day one. Mm -hmm. um, I came out with my story in about 2016. Um, and I just needed to be sure that my platform that I could come out on uh, that I wouldn't be affected career wise. Um, mm -hmm. I needed to make sure that I got myself a good foundation at first. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to speak about it for so many years, but there's always a stigma around it. At, sometimes I think we're really getting to it now. I think people are starting mm -hmm. to see a lot more um, and I'm hopefully helping with that. Um, but there's also clothing that I do as well with um, first of where the joint pain is I've done. I've done it where it lights up. I've done it in glow in the dark. I've just tried to do anything visual because this is not a disease that you can see. So anything mm -hmm. I can help with visually for others to see and recognize and to aware um, is what I really try to strive for each season. Um, and my version of advocacy is to talk about it, usually in writing, uh, but also going live um, that I find that that pain, again, because it is, whether it's a form of arthritis or it's pain, it's invisible. So people don't understand it. And, and that usually leads to not believing it and then the stigma and so on. So I talk about it any chance I can get and share my experience. And especially with the uh, war on opioids, which is not always including people who actually need some sort of treatment. Um, I, th I find that that talking about it is important because if I'm not invited to the table, I will invite myself. Um, but I also write books about helping people who have chronic pain um, live better with it. So I have I have some books you can find them on Amazon. Nudge nudge. Um, but um, so and I think but one of the things that's important is I find a lot of people, especially in the states, in the community, are beginning to say that they can't advocate anymore because it's not safe. Because pay, bringing attention to yourself can affect your treatment. So it, just a reminder that if you want to do advocacy, and as you can see, there's many ways of doing it. Just make sure that you protect your ability to get treated first. Uh, and Natalie wants to uh, mention that. Okay, she actually says, I know the end of the sentence says, and there's a, she said, yes, Michael, lots of stigma. And I guess um, that really resonated. Like, gee, maybe we should, and this completely diverts from my prepared script here. Um, let's talk about this stigma. Is that something that you guys uh, have experienced yourself? And for those watching, if you've experienced stigma, we'd love to hear your, your experience in the comments. Uh, what about Michael? You were talking about the not talking about your RA because it could impact your career. And as, as someone who works in a in a more um, public facing career. Um, what was, talk a little bit about what was some of the concerns you think it would have affected your success? Um, yeah, actually I do probably believe it would at the beginning. Um, I kept it a secret for about five years. Um, so, Nobody really knew, but um, I had major contracts with big corporations for a lot of collaborations. And um, I think that that would have hindered them if they knew that I had a debilitating disease. Um, I think that uh, they wouldn't have the same confidence sometimes in me. I think I had to prove myself without them knowing first that I could mm -hmm. do all of this and then come out with my story um, was the right way for me to unfold it. Um, but everybody's different everybody has a different work experience um i mean if i i think today is a lot different than it was when i came out six five six years ago with my story or even 10 years ago or more that i've been in the industry um so i think that now coming out in 2021 with your story and whatever you are going to put out there 
um, as long as yes, you're right, keeping your treatment safe first of, and yourself safe first. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that it's a lot different now. There's a lot more mm -hmm. outlets. There's these panels that we have now that we've never used mm -hmm. to have. We have social media where there's such a great outlet now that you can speak to almost anybody yeah. that you'd like to speak to. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a way also to converse um, with you know the community that there wasn't 10 years ago. I didn't have an, a people mm -hmm. around my age that I could find around the world to even speak mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So now that there's the, all these connections um, that are available, I think that people are in a different state of mind in a different setting now what about linda uh have you experienced stigma yeah well i mean i started out the same i, I was to start out sharing my story because i really wanted people you know the average person unless they get sick don't understand how difficult it is to access care sometimes in our healthcare mm -hmm. system um i mean if you have a heart attack and i say my husband had a heart attack in february it was like bang 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 he's treated got the stent in sent home but with our disease there is no cure and so we have to live with it for the rest of our lives so i started out sharing my story just to try to get it out there and this was 20 plus years ago um, and then i started working more on the policy side to try to address some of the stigma of our disease i mean very early in the pandemic it was uh, Health Canada acted to change the opioid prescribing because it used to be you had to go in to your doctor to get a refill on your pain prescription. Um, once the pandemic hit, I mean, it was awful because how, you know, you're going to go into your doctor to get refills and put yourself at risk. So Health Canada allowed for virtual appointment refills very quickly. Um, and I think, you know, they've reached out to the chronic pain patient community about the stigma, the issue of stigma and the language that they use that, you know, I was seeing things coming from my own government on Facebook, on their Facebook page about, you know, <clears throat> opioid use and how awful it was and all these things that, you know, it, you know, you shouldn't be taking them and, it's so dangerous and i'm even going to my own pharmacy um to get a to refill my prescription you know it has to be exactly 30 days they won't refill refill it before 29 um you know it's just the extra trips that i've had to do and uh, mm -hmm. go away on holidays they give me 30 days supply so you know if i wanted to go down to florida for two months in the winter that would not be a possibility unless I got an exemption, which by the way, charge you $25 on top of all the other co-pays and the premiums and all the other costs. So there's still a lot of stigma out there. And I think that all of us doing things like this and speaking on Facebook Live and sharing our stories and Michael with your fashion and all these things will help get normalize what we you know mm -hmm. our disease. Our, we're, we're, we're the same as everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that the point is that there are millions of Canadians who live with pain every day. And, and the more of us speak up, uh, the more and share our experience with our elected representative, like whether it's your MPP and your MP or your city councillor, etc. Like I think share your experience because they're going to act on what they know. And if they don't, don't know that they're voters because it gets down to this if if they don't know that their voters uh, think that reasonable and adequate uh, or rather well-controlled pain is an issue in their life they're not going to include that on their mental radar and i do think like in terms of me for my stigma because i am visibly disabled and use a wheelchair um yes there's tons of stigma and it's ra stigma it's pain stigma it's accessibility stigma um, but I like to say that one of the things that I think actually helps me is that my the impact of RA is so visible. And we are in living in an amazing time where effective treatment is increasingly making RA, let's say, or RA or any type of autoimmune arthritis, an invisible illness. And that's great news. But it comes with a dark side to the coin, too, that people don't question that I might need, you know, that I need certain accommodations, may not want to give them to me, but they don't question my need for them. But if your disease is or your condition is invisible, then you're coming up towards a whole other struggle in terms of being believed. 
So on one hand, there's the struggle of people don't believe in you or the struggle of people don't want to include you because, you know, accessibility, right? Um, but that kind of brings us to the next question, which is Kelly, uh, Kathleen, who says um, she wants to know um, uh, about biologics and especially how we handle the immunosuppressant aspect. Oops, Linda dropped again. Uh, so we'll start with Michael. Um, so how do you handle the immunosuppressant part of being on a biologic? Um, I very Which careful. I assume you are. I assume you are, but I don't know. That. Yeah, yeah, I am on a biologic. Um, I've tried different ones. Some of them just didn't agree with my body. They didn't work. Um, I was allergic to one of them. I had a, I've never been allergic to a medicine in my life. So that was really scary. Um, but yeah, I, mm -hmm. I finally found one that works for me. And um, I've been on it for years now. And um, I'm able to cope with it the way I know how to do it. Um, I take it before bed and it just mm -hmm. is the way I do it. Um, I think other people have infusions, which I used to do um, mm -hmm. every two weeks. And then there's some people that get it every month. And, you know, everybody mm -hmm. differs a little bit. Um, I've had my a medication both in the U.S. and in Canada. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of a difference with um, dosages. Mm -hmm. So uh, that has been a little bit tricky sometimes. But um, I think that, you know, you do have to kind of find which one is right for you. There's there's a lot on the market now. So um, you you have choices. Mm -hmm. So, Linda, we're talking about how to deal particularly with the, the immunosuppressant aspect of being on a biologic or message like saying, how do you deal with being um, immunosuppressed? Yeah, I mean, I've been on biologics for over 20 years. I started in 1999. Um, I had no choice. If I wanted to live, if I not for my biologic, I would not be alive right now. I know that. I am just as, I mean, people, they say people don't die from RA, but I would have died from RA. And uh, and so for me, it, it's just the, that trade-off, right? I, I have a life because of this biologic for as long as I'm able to live it. It's a bit of a juggle with the, with the vaccine, like the COVID-19 vaccine, trying to time it because I'm on Arencia Abitsep, which is one of the ones that can have a reduced vaccine response. So I had to stop you know, a week before my vaccine and then not start it up for a week after. So on top of the side effects, from the vaccination and everything a little bit of a juggle but you know it for me the trade-off it's it's worth it and you know i've had issues with my lungs i've you know I, I every time i get a cold i end up with pneumonia um very you know i get really really sick and that's probably because of the immunosuppressant i i don't have a lot to fight it back but you know i have a life i'm able to spend time with my kids and my grandkids and you know it uh i guess that it's just my life <laughs> So, so interestingly, I think, I, I think two things I learned about being immunosuppressed is like, I've always gotten sicker. I've always been sensitive even before being immunosuppressed because RA can be, make you more sensitive to infection as well. The sad aspect. And it's always hit me harder. Um, and then after my logics, that's just sort of accelerated a bit. I will say, so two things. Number one, the pandemic has been amazing. I haven't been sick. I've overdone it and had flares, yeah. but I have not been sick because everybody's careful. Everybody, everybody's washing their hands more. Everybody's wearing a mask. I'm wearing a mask. So my lesson from the pandemic is that I fully intend to, um, to keep wearing a mask, especially in winter um, after the pandemic, because I have not been sick for almost two years and it's astonishing. I will say being immunosuppressed, like it doesn't mean that, you know, you're a disease magnet. I still remember when my sister's kids were little. So I think they were like two or three. So 13 years ago, there was one Christmas where both of them had that, you know, little kids, it's their job to be sick. So they develop an immune system, but they were both snotty. Like there was snot everywhere. And they were the, they were the age where they just wanted to give hugs. And I fully anticipated that after spending Christmas Eve with them and getting hugged and getting sneezed at and coughed at, that I would be sick. And I didn't get sick. So it doesn't mean that you are automatically constantly sick. And here's the other thing in five years ago, 
um, I got the flu and it was the N1H1, which is particularly nasty. And it attacked my lungs. I ended up in the ICU on a ventilator, almost died a couple of times. And everybody thinks it's because of my being on an immunosuppressant. At the time, they said it was probably more likely because I also have asthma. And they actually said that I survived because my biologic made me so healthy as I am now. Because that's a really important point. Because if you look, I reached a point, and it took several years being on the biologic. But I reached a point that when, you know, when you take your blood, blood tests, and all the numbers are red because you have RA. I reach a point where on my blood test, you can't tell I have RA. If the only seen the blood test, I'm basically a healthy woman. And everybody says that this was why I actually survived that, that flu and came out and regained my health, my health. So I think the important part here is not the immunosuppressant. Yes, you have to be somewhat more careful. Yes, you might get sick more often. Yes, you may get very sick. Few people do, though. Keep in mind that's rare. But I think it is manageable. This is not, we'll, we will obliterate your immune system. That happens, like, with a stem cell transplant or chemotherapy for cancer. This is, it reduces it. And it is usually manageable. And it may help you get healthy enough to be stronger in other ways. So I'm hoping that Linda will get back just in time to, to kind of wrap up. Um, Natalie shares that um, not a disease magnet and still strong and healthy, which is great. Do want to get back to one of the early comments. Um, again, Natalie said that, um, that the... Um, she went to a rehab center in Montreal that did a really great job at helping her recognize her limits because I think recognizing your limits is forever difficult. Um, and Linda's back. Um, but, and I think, and I think just want to emphasize that this is a process. Like, I think we've all talked about how, um, how it is still a process and a struggle. But have any of you had help from your doctor and occupational therapist or whatever in learning your limits? What about you, Michael? Um, yeah, I actually went to the Mayo Clinic for mm -hmm. a, after I was diagnosed um, to fully learn about what I could and could not do and what would help me and specifics mm -hmm. to my body. So I did um, do that. It took a long time to get into that program, but once you are in it, um, it was very useful for me. I spent, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a few weeks there and it was very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, every, I mean, I'm the best knowledge of what my limits are. So help that helps, but you just have to really feel it within your body and every day is different. So yeah. it could change. What about you, Linda? Have you had any, any help from, from professionals in oh, figuring yeah. out what your limits are? I've had great physiotherapists and I've had good rheumatologists. I've had bad rheumatologists as well, um, but I have really great yeah. now. I've been a good one for quite a number of years. Uh, physiotherapists have, have saved my life. Acupuncture, um, when my hip was gone and I needed a new hip, uh, my physio sent me to a traditional acupuncturist and that made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, but really too, I, I learned to navigate a lot of it myself. I've always mm -hmm. lived in rural areas so I didn't have access to some of the wonderful arthritis clinics that, that are happening, like the one in Newmarket or South Lake, where you can go and do an arthritis program and for two weeks and learn everything. Um, a lot of what I learned, I learned the hard way, um, but I learned it good. <laughs> So I don't forget what I've learned um, because of that. But, uh, and that was one of the reasons I got involved with advocacy and Kappa and everything as well, because I wanted to help other people avoid having to learn it like I did. Yeah, and I think it just emphasizes, we should, we should mention that, that Michael is um, originally from the US, which is hence the Mayo Clinic. Uh, but here in Canada, talk to your family doctor or your rheumatologist about a referral to physiotherapy or occupational therapy can help you um, 
learn your limits and have some guidance on that. And other than that, like start, start kind of checking in with yourself and your body and how you're feeling. So just before we go and Linda disappears again, uh, let's just talk about where people can find you online. I'm the seatedview.com is my website and it has links to all my social media channels. Uh, Michael, where can people find you? Uh, michaelkaluba.com and I'm on every social media platform at Michael Kaluba. Awesome. And Linda? The same with me. I'm Linda, Linda A. Wilhelm at gmail.com and uh, get me through Kappa. You can go to the Kappa website. Every, mm -hmm. All the information's there. I'm on Facebook as well mm -hmm. and Twitter. I'm not as active on Twitter, but uh, uh, yeah, no, I the people have Googled me and I, I find it interesting when they Google you and they come up with all this information. So that's fantastic. And again, there's the uh, Kappa is, I believe, arthritis patient. Yeah, yes. patient.ca. All right. And I just want to say thank you to Kappa for um, for inviting me to work with them for the National Pain Awareness Week. And it's been it's been a blast. Thank you everybody for watching. And again, don't forget if you're watching this after we were live, please do participate in the comments because we will be back there. All right, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Lena. Bye, Michael. Thank you. Bye everyone.